Hi everyone, this is Jesus Rodriguez. I'm the editor of Orinoco Tribune, uh, an anti-imperialist website based in Caracas, Venezuela. And today I want to talk with you about Venezuelan migrants. That's an issue that we have covered in Orinoco Tribune in several occasions. And uh, the idea is to cover a few issues that are I didn't have time to talk about while I had an interview a few weeks ago with the U.S. outlet Fire This Time. That was a great interview. They had a good approach, uh, but there were many, you know, issues, many things that I wanted to mention, but, you know, the nature of the interview didn't allow me to do it. So I, because the issue is very relevant, and we believe in Orinoco Tribune that it's become more relevant as close as we reach the election day in the U.S. to uh, provide you with some additional information from the Venezuelan perspective, from the perspective that of be objective and balanced, you know, uh, uh, as much as possible, of course. So, um, again, uh, the fire this time interview was great. Um, there were reactions on that interview. Some, uh, I read some comments and some reels about the former Venezuelan consul talk about Venezuelan line uh, uh, to my, the U.S. migration uh, uh, in order to get asylum. They tried to make a big you know, deal out of that, that everyone, every Venezuelan knows that is true. Is, and that is why I refer to to the George Harris uh, show. He is an stand-up comedy Venezuelan based in Miami. He is not Chavista, of course. He is the opposite, and he has made several jokes about Venezuelan lying to migrant to you know U.S. migration in order to get uh, you know asylum in the U.S. That's common knowledge uh, uh, here in Venezuela, and I believe that that's common knowledge also in the U.S. Of course, there are different cases, there are different, you know, realities, uh, maybe just a very tiny percentage of, of those that apply for asylum are really, uh, uh, you know, asylum seekers, political, whatever, but the reality is that many of our migrants are economic migrants. Uh, most of them being victims of U.S. sanctions, U.S. blockades, U.S. aggressions against Venezuela. Not since Maduro's time, but since Chavez's time. So, uh, I, I, in that interview, we talk about the, the, the terrible, uh, you know, political manipulation, especially in the state of Florida and Texas, you know, uh, sending... Uh, you know, putting Venezuelan migrants in buses, not knowing exactly where they are going and sending them to mostly to New York and to Chicago. And, the, and in that way, creating some sort of migrant crisis in those cities. And of course, exacerbating xenophobia, uh, exacerbating the propaganda against Chavismo, against socialism. And uh, of course, many people say that it's Maduro sending migrants to the U.S. because this and that. And the reality is the opposite. The, the, the Chavista government has been actually implementing uh, social programs in order to try to bring back Venezuelans uh, from uh, not only from the U.S., but from other countries in South America. But anyway, I, we will talk about that uh, in these few minutes that I'm planning to talk to you about several issues. First, I want to mention uh, the historic background. You know, Venezuela has been always a country uh, that received migrants since the 70s when the oil boom exploded here in Venezuela and people start talking about Saudi Venezuela. Uh, and, and that trend lasted until, I don't know, the year 2000, 2005. Uh, so what I want to say with that is that we in Venezuela have humongous uh, um, expatriate communities, uh, migrant communities here in Venezuela. We are talking about five or maybe six million Colombians uh, uh, living in Venezuela. Uh, we are talking about between uh, 500,000 
a Peruvians and 500,000 uh, Ecuadorians living in Venezuela. Peru, uh, uh, we have a, like a, a Syrian community close to 1 million people. Uh, so we have been a country uh, traditionally receptive of migrations and treating them right without xenophobia most of the time. Uh, we are a welcoming country and we always have to treat migrants with respect and with uh, gratitude. So it's somehow for many Venezuelans living here in Venezuela right now and watching the news about xenophobia against Venezuelans living abroad uh, is pretty disturbing and upsetting. Uh, because it's the opposite of what we have been doing with migrants when they come to Venezuela. So that's something important. I believe that is that we need to say. So we have these big colonies uh, of um, different migrants that live in Venezuela. And of course, they many of them have uh, Colombian passports and also Venezuelan passports, Peruvian passports, uh, Ecuadorian passports. They have both nationalities most of the time. And some of them uh, migrated to, to, to their, you know, uh, uh, countries, back to their countries when the crisis in Venezuela began to get uh, worse, especially since 2015, uh, between 2015 and 2019, 20, uh, uh, due to sanctions, due to what we call economic warfare. So... Um, but that's something that I want to mention uh, I, uh, in, a, in, in a few more minutes. But I also wanted to say that uh, during Chavez time, we initiated a massive uh, regularization uh, uh, process for migrants that were living in Venezuela without documents. So we uh, 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 regularized their you know, status here in Venezuela and we are talking about somewhere somewhere between 1.5 and 2 million Colombians, for example, to give you an idea on how big uh, that program was, especially if you take into consideration that Venezuela is a country of 30 million people. Um, we have to talk about the Lima Group. That, way, that was a group created by the U.S. and Canada in order to try to isolate diplomatically Venezuela to oust President Maduro. And that Lima group disappeared a few years ago because they were not able to achieve their goal of the stabilization. Uh, but those Lima group countries promoted since 2012, 2013, the migration of Venezuelans to South America. Uh, so countries and presidents from countries in Latin America, especially, I mean, I'm talking about far right uh, governments in the region at that time, invited Venezuelans to move there to escape uh, communism, to escape Chavism or whatever they, they call it. So uh, that created the beginning of the migration crisis in Venezuela. And many Venezuelans were trapped into that trend. Of course, the economic situation in Venezuela was deteriorating sharply uh, and, and they opted to move to Chile, to Bolivia, sorry, to Chile, to Peru, to Ecuador, to Colombia. But many of them were the sons or, you know, the descendants of those migrants that came before from those countries. So many of them have this dual citizenship. That is something that I want to mention ahead. Uh, so between 2015, 2016, and 2020, we have this humongous peak of Venezuelan migrants moving to the south. But then they face the, the, the xenophobia and the, and, the, and the complexities of the economies in those countries. But before going there, I want to mention uh, the sanctions because sanctions also play an important role in the economic destabilization of the country. I'm talking about more than 900 sanctions uh, overall imposed by the US and Europe against Venezuela. Those sanctions affect mostly the ordinary Venezuelans, the economy of Venezuela and not the elites. Uh, uh, so, so that's the main reason behind the migration of Venezuelans to South America and a few years later to the U.S. Uh, 
the U.S. Uh, during these years took control of Citgo, which is a Venezuelan-owned corporation, Venezuelan state-owned corporation uh, uh, based in the U.S. And they basically robbed us uh, Citgo. Uh, they are promoting uh, the interests of ExxonMobil in Guyana, and that creates the, that's part of another important issue that we have been facing in recent months, which is the territorial dis dispute over the Esequibo territory that is a complex issue that we have addressed in Orinoco Tribune several times. Uh, so uh, we have to add to that the sanctions to the robbery of Venezuelan assets abroad, including gold in England, in the UK, two, uh, I mean, 1.5 tons of gold were robbed by the Bank of England in the UK, in the UK as part of that you know, uh, aggression against Venezuela in, uh, in an attempt to destabilize uh, Maduro's government. Uh, we also have to take into account that the U.S. has implemented something very similar to the wet feet, dry feet policy that was applied uh, for Cubans migrating to the U.S. Uh, so many Venezuelans that uh, initially uh, moved to South America, when they realized the xenophobia in those countries against Venezuelans, when they realized that the economic situation was not good there, when they realized that, that uh, they were exploited, they and, they and when they learned that the U.S. was granting asylum almost automatically to Venezuelans, mo uh, moving, requesting asylum in the U.S., they decided to, they opted to, some of them came back to Venezuela because already in 2020, 2020 first, the economic situation was getting a little bit better. But some of them also uh, from Venezuela or, or, or from the best, best countries in South America, they decided to move to the north, mm, to the U.S., I mean, mostly. So that encouraged uh, Venezuelans to go to the U.S. So, and that is the result of a, a direct U.S. policy towards Venezuelan migrants, because that's part of the strategy that they, they always use to try to satanize you know, socialist countries, non-align uh, uh, with U.S. dictates countries like Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and many other countries around the world. So uh, Venezuelans feeling exploitation, criminalization, xenophobia, began this trip back to uh, uh, Venezuela, and some of them uh, decided to go to the U.S. Uh, in, this, uh, in that particular moment, we are, I'm talking about maybe 2019, 2020, uh, the Venezuelan government began to implement what is called the Vuelta a la Patria program, which is a, a social program specially designed to bring for free Venezuelans that didn't have means to come back to the country and, uh, and basically the Venezuelan government repatriate them to Venezuela for free. And that program is still running, of course has been heavily affected because of the economic uh, crisis in Venezuela resulting from the sanctions, uh, but the, the, the program is still running. Um, what else is important to say in this uh, in this area? Uh, that program began when uh, the Venezuela se arregló trend began to circulate, uh, and that's something that I believe was launched by by the same right Venezuelan right wingers uh, that are trying to make fun from from the small steps that Venezuela took and has been taking in order to. Uh, improve its economy. And that is, has been happening since 2020 uh, with a GDP indicator showing uh, economic recovery. And we have been recovering since uh, 2020 first uh, without steadily and without interruptions. And that's important to say. Um, so uh, then, you know, in, 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 in those years, uh, the Darien issue became very important. And, and I want to highlight that in that Darien issue, uh, uh, it's important to talk about the, the business of migration. There, there are a lot of corporations, law firms, migrant experts, NGOs, 
multilateral organizations making money out of the migration crisis, as they call it, the Venezuelan migration crisis. Uh, and one cannot deny that there is a crisis, but also one cannot uh, um, say that that business is there. There are airlines making a lot of money out of this. There are uh, travel agents that are basically Coyote travel agents organizing trips for Venezuelans that live in South America or in Venezuela and that want to go to the U.S. Venezuelans initially, when they began to realize that they could go to the U.S. and get asylum easily, they traveled through Mexico by plane most of the time. Uh, and uh, there were these tour uh, coyote uh, agencies that organized everything for them, from the air ticket to the buses, to go to the north, to the hotels, to stay a few days there, and to the coyotes that took the, uh, to them uh, to, you know, to cross the border and, you know, uh, surrender themselves to the migrant agents in the border and request uh, asylum immediately. That's basically the procedure. But a few years ago, because of U.S. pressures, Mexico's government uh, took the decision of uh, stop granting, uh, I mean, Venezuelans didn't need visas to enter uh, Mexico. And because of U.S. pressure, the, Venezuela, the Mexican government decided to request visas to Venezuelans, and that's absolutely uh, a, a sovereign country of Mexico. But of course, that creates the somehow the Darien uh, issue, at least uh, the, 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 the crisis connected to Venezuela. Because, I mean, the Darien, uh, you know, crisis is not only uh, related to Venezuelans, but uh, at least the increase in Venezuelans crossing the Darien jungle is the result of that decision taken by the Mexican government under U.S. pressures. And it's important to say that. And it's important to say that because, I mean, people are dying in the Darien and they are not stopping that. I mean, those decisions do not stop the migrants because when migrants decide to migrate, they, they do it, disregarding the obstacles that governments put in the way. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that the Mexican government might have been responsible for the death of many people crossing the Darien also. And of course, the U.S. government that is pushing Mexico to implement that, those visa restrictions and also the U.S. government for uh, welcoming uh, and granting asylum to Venezuelans almost, almost immediately just to, you know, to engross the propaganda against Venezuela and, and against Chavismo and and socialism and all the you know media campaigns that they launch against us. So that's part of the problem. Uh, another question that I wonder when I see people talking about the Darien is why they are not highways in the Darien. A lot of people talk since I was a kid about uh, uh, the Darien uh, being a protected area and for ec ecological reasons uh, they have not constructed. I mean, I. I mean, ecology is nice, but uh, all the highways and roads that has been built uh, in our region and around the world has always implicated, you know, ecological, you know, uh, issues. And in my opinion, what happened, the lack of infrastructure in the Darien is a result of U.S. racism. U.S. supremacy, that they didn't, didn't want to ha uh, South America to have a connect link with Central America because that might threat the, uh, the U.S. interest and the U.S. security because of migration and things like that. And the U.S. always has thinking that Central America is their backyard, is their, is their area uh, that they always have wanted to control. And, and, and actually, in reality, uh, they have controlled it most of the time and in most of the countries, not all of them, thankfully. But anyway, uh, it's important to talk about those things. I mean, why, why, why there is no a highway or a road between Colombia and Panama? Without mentioning that the U.S. Uh, was the one that, you know, uh, cut Panama from Colombia in order to build the Panama Canal. But that's another long story that I'm going to stop to talk about uh, uh, in these minutes. Uh, so Venezuelan migrants has been using that, uh, that option, the, the, that path to the U.S. Uh, to the Darien, among many other 
migrants from South America and even from Africa and Asia. So it's a complex reality that people need to address. I mean, uh, and when you talk about uh, the ecological issues around uh, the Darien uh, highway or road, uh, you wonder why Canada mining company is exploding and creating this humongous ecological damage in Panama that created that, that you know promoted this recent uh, protest in Panama and no one did anything uh, in the Panamian government against that. But they do care about ecolog ecology when you know uh, they want to comply with U.S. dictates of not building a, a, a road in the Darien. So th those are like the hypocrisies that you notice every year. Now I'm going to talk about new developments. Venezuela signed recently a repatriation agreement with the U.S., and that's very important because, uh, uh, in my opinion, and from what I hear from people living in the U.S. that have reduced the number of Venezuelan migrants arriving in the U.S. in recent months. Because basically what the Venezuelan government agreed with the U.S. government is to uh, repatriate uh, migrants that were not granted asylum. Uh, and, uh, and that, uh, of course, this caught as many people thinking and going there, but facing the possibility of uh, um, Send, being sent back to Venezuela. Uh, so, so that's an option that right now many migrants are evaluating carefully uh, before uh, deciding to go to the U.S. Uh, and I believe that's positive. Uh, Maduro's recent figures and denunciations of coyote mafias linked with Venezuelan uh, far right. I mean, there are mafias connected to Venezuelan far rights of coyotes taking Venezuela to the U.S. That's a, that's a true. Uh, and also Maduro has many right-wingers in Venezuela uh, and NGOs and even multilateral organizations talk about uh, 7 million Venezuelan uh, uh, migrants. I believe that's an exaggeration. But the, uh, uh, President Maduro uh, talked a few months ago about 2.5 million Venezuelans uh, in their government accounts uh, are being really, uh, I mean, that the government considered migrants. So maybe somewhere in the middle, I'm talking about maybe 4 million Venezuelans might, uh, you know, if you uh, take an average, might be the, the, the number of Venezuelan migrants, which is not a small number, especially if you took into consideration that, that uh, Venezuela is a country of 30 million people. So we are talking about what, about 12, 13% of the population decided to migrate in the last, I don't know, uh, 10 years. That's a, a, a terrible number, but you don't have to blame um, a chavismo of that. Of course, there might be some economic errors taken by the government, but the most of the hardship of the economic crisis that we have lived in recent years is the result of U.S. and European aggression. Uh, it's important also to talk about the varying conditions of migrants not receiving the proper attention in the U.S., especially those being subjected to human tra trafficking by the governors of Texas and Florida, and they live in, in very daring conditions in shelters in, in Chicago and in, in New York, and some of them live in the street. They are begging in the street. They don't have sanitary conditions. I re a few days ago, a Venezuelan kid died in a shelter in, in Chicago, and no one talks too much about that. Uh, and no one put uh, enough money to solve that problem when, when there are enough resources in the U.S. to send to Israel and to Palestine to kill people there, but not to, uh, you know, solve a migration crisis that the U.S. itself has created. Uh, so those are important issues that, that, that need to be discussed. Another important issue is that the remittances. I mean, many people say that Venezuelan economy or, you know, economic recovery has been the result of remittances, and that's a big lie. Recent World Bank numbers talk about Venezuela, uh, I mean, the, the percentage of the GDP that Venezuela received in 2022 for remittances from the U.S. represented only 0.6% of our GDP. And we are like in the position nine or 10 in Latin America 
in, in, in that, you know, our category. We, you have Honduras with 26%, El Salvador with 24%, Jamaica with 22 Haiti with 22 Nicaragua with 20 Guatemala with 19 Dominican Republic with 9 Dominica with 8 St. Vincent with 7 Grenada with 5 Mexico with 4% of its GDP uh, uh, represented by the remittances that migrants living abroad send to those countries. So that big lie that the Venezuelan economy relies on remittances is that, a big lie. So these are the things that I wanted to mention you just to up, update you with, with some information, some uh, our perspective as Chavistas about the migration crisis. It is a crisis uh, uh, and we are not denying that there is a migration crisis, but you have to understand that there are several factors that not only depend on Venezuela for those migrants to go there. So thank you for listening to us and a happy 2024 for all of you. And thank you for following us and please donate to Orinoco Tribune if you can. Un abrazo.